Hello everyone, this is Ernesto Alvarez and Garrett Gay from GEO News, sponsored by Charlie, a media company. We would like to start off with the latest, latest in hydrofracking. What is hydrofracking, you ask? Hydrofracking is the process of drilling and injecting fluid into the ground at a high pressure in order to fracture shale rocks to release natural gas inside. Why is this important, you ask? The Natural Resources Defense Council, also known as NRDC, has recently claimed that hydrofracking results in co contaminating water supplies and, quote, dangerous air pollution, destroyed streams, and devastated landscapes. In fact, there has been over 1,000 documented cases of water contamination next to areas of gas drilling, as well as cases of sensory, respiratory, and neurological damage due to ingested contaminated water nearby. They even include known carcinogens and toxins. Thank you. Now we will speak with EPA correspondent Garrett Gay on what is concern contained in hydraulic fluid as well as many other important facts. Thank you, Ernesto. And as you can see here, this is the makeup of hydraulic fluid. And as you can see, this big blue part here, 99.51% of hydraulic fluid is water and sand. And this is broken down, the basically 0.5% of it is made up of uh, surfact uh, surfactant, a uh, potassium chloride, a gelling agent, scale inhibitor, a pH adjusting agent, a breaker, crosslinker, iron control, a corrosion inhibitor, a biocide, acid, and a friction reducer. And as you can see, this is a very, very small percentage of the overall, but can still be extremely dangerous. Welcome back. The NRDC, along with various other environmental organizations, have pointed to the tr tremendous water issues at hand. Fracking's extensive use of water creates a cycle of environmental concerns that will affect people and animals in the long run. Yes, it is true that fracking inevitably brings an extreme le level of water consumption, but the process is accompanied with another hidden risk, water consumption. Stay tuned, folks. We will speak with our White House correspondent, as well as the leading scientist from the best department at the University of Rochester after this break. All right, Ernesto, and here is going to be the economic part of the um, hydraulic fracking discussion as has been happening recently. Um, New York State Governor Andrew Cuomo um, has banned the hydro hydraulic fracking in New York State, um, citing um, his one of his chief health administrators, How uh, Howard Zucker, um, who s stated very plainly, I cannot support high volume hydraulic fracking in the great state of New York. Um, as you can see right here, the green part is um, this is the Marcellus Shale in New York, Pennsylvania, and West Virginia. It's a very large area, and as you can see here, most of the hydraulic, um, the possible hydraulic shale is concentrated in the southern part of New York, which is um, one of the more uh, economically poor areas. Um, and it has been uh, commented that um, some people in the southern tier of New York have spoken out very heavily against um, Governor Cuomo's move to ban fracking. And as you can further see here, Pennsylvania, whose um, natural gas production by the Marcellus Shale has increased exponentially over the last few years. The same can be in some ways said in West Virginia and to a slighter extent in Ohio as we see that um, New York has uh, decline very steadily. Um, the economic advantages are actually fairly straightforward. And uh, Pennsylvania state data has supplied us with um, numbers that say that energy employment has more than doubled from 13,059 jobs to 28,229 in early 2014. And the average salary for these jobs is uh, roughly $93,000 a year, which is $40,000 more dollars than can be said of the median in the state. A uh, dairy farmer from New York, New York was uh, quoted as saying that um, he was hoping that, the, that by leasing his land to energy companies, he could pay his property taxes on some 700 acres of farmland. And quote, 
the amount of shale available is more valuable than the surface of the land will ever be. He also states that now the state controls the most valuable part of his land. And one of the most major impacts that, um, positive economic impacts that the hydraulic fracking has had is that in um, Pennsylvania, the um, energy companies have generated $2.1 billion in tax revenue from the fracking boom. And many of these funds have gone towards infrastructure, including um, road and bridge building, water and sewer projects, local housing initiatives, and parks. So there is a plus to this that it does bring um, massive revenue to the state in which it's used in, but that certainly must be balanced with the possible environmental impacts that it could have. Also hailed by Dr. Zucker, once again, the uh, one of the chief health administrators of Governor Andrew Cuomo's um, administration, who stated as saying that he saw numerous red flags and the significant uncertainties about the kinds of adverse health outcomes that may be associated with fracking. Lisa McKenzie, though, an assistant professor at the Colorado School of Public Health, who has co-written two studies on the health impacts of drilling in her state, said that Quote, she thinks there is a potential for health, effect, for health effects, but how significant really needs more study. The recent banning on hydraulic fracking in New York State um, has been hailed by many environmental leaders. Um, what, the Department of Environmental Conservation Commissioner Joe Martins played down the economic benefits of fracking while citing a laundry list of potential adverse effects. The contamination of drinking water supplies, the impact on air and land resources, as well as community impacts, including increased truck traffic and wear on bridges. Now we will have a special guest, a University of Rochester geology expert, Kayla Kimling. Are you ready for us, Kayla? Yes, thank you for having me. Now tell me, why should people tune into tonight's newscast, be worried about an issue such as hydrofracking? Why should this take precedence to other leading environment issues such as global warming? Excellent question. To put this into perspective, I will outline an equation that will speak for themselves. The amount of water consumed by the gas wells currently in the United States can be described by the equation 500,000 active gas wells in the U.S. times 8 million gallons of water per fracking times 18 times a well can be fracked is an unspeakable number of 72 trillion gallons of water of, is being consumed by this process. Now we will speak with EPA correspondent Gary Gay on what exactly is contained in this hydraulic fluid. As you can see here, this is a, um, a well comparison taken from uh, Michael D. Holloway's book, uh, Fracking the Operations and Environmental Consequences of Hydraulic Fracking. Um, what he does here is he takes his table using data from the EPA and many um, state environmental studies, and he goes through for each of the specific types of shales, and he just discusses uh, specific pieces of um, the technical aspects of the shales. Um, and for example, he talks about the estimated basin area of um, many of the shale basins. One of the most interesting facts, though, is he talks about very specifically the depths at which most of the times these shales would occur. And as you can see, for the Barnett Shale, um, 8,500, Fayetteville, 700, or 7,000, Hinesville, 13,500, the Marcellus, 8,500, the Woodford, 11,000, and the Antrim at 12,000, with the New Albany even further down at 43,500. Um, this is, can then be compared to the depth of the base of the treat, of treatable water, and this is in feet as well. And as you can see, there is a large gap in between um, many of these uh, shales and the actual water that the aquifers, um, for example, with the Barnett Shale, 
um, being down at uh, 8,500 feet. The depth of the base of the base of Treble Water, the very bottom, is about 1,200 feet. For any New Yorkers out there, the Marcellus Shale, which occurs at around once again 8,500 feet, the base of Treble Water is right around 850 feet. So there is a large gap that any material, fracking fluid or methane, will have, would have to travel up through to get into the aquifers in the water basin. Thank you, Garrett. Yes, excellent. For viewers back home wondering about what contaminants may be located nearby in their well, you can go on fracfocus.org, lo located by fracfocus 2.0. And basically what this website is, you find the well by clicking this tab over here. Then you choose a state, as in, uh, let's try Utah today. Utah, you may choose a county, but we're just going to go ahead and search to show viewers back home. And then we will click on the PDF version of a well nearby. Click on the downloaded PDF. And then here you will see the different contaminants, the start date, the end date, and then all the information available for viewers back home. Thank you. And now on to our next news story, the missing link between chicken and dinosaur, announced by paleontology expert Garrett Gay. All right, folks, I got a real treat for you. The um, Chickenosaurus badassicus as Mahather Fahakahis is was one terrifying creature. And as you can see behind me is a um, artist's rendition of what the Chickenosaurus would have possibly looked like back in its heyday. And as you can see, it has some pretty terrifying features. I mean, first of all, it has fangs. It has a beak and fangs. I'm, I'm not sure what evolutionary trait that would, um, how that would have ever helped its survival. Um, it has like those things that raptors pop out, like in the movie Jurassic. Horns, odd feet. I mean, those are like straight off of a Tyrannosaurus Rex. And by God, it has a spiked tail. I mean, I, I didn't know that things even had this. And I mean, like, it's natural predator, um, the cat, whose name may or may not be Charlie, would have hunted these things for their fantastic tasting meat, as we are told by uh, other paleontological experts. I don't know how they know that. I'm actually kind of scared. Thank you, and have a good night. All right, folks, and to discuss the natural predators of the Chickenosaurus, um, it had, as, as, as can, you can see, um, it probably was not a very good swimmer, so any time it ended up in the water, it probably would have been eaten by a larger, um, larger uh, sea creatures. Um, as you can see, also, we have the artist renditions of the um, creature's most dangerous predator, um, something that resembled a cat and was named Charlie. That's all I have for you, folks. Have a good night.